Right, we're in Revelation, Revelation chapter 17. We're going to talk today about false religion. False religion. And I'm going to read Revelation chapter 17 and 18 to you. You're going to have to guess and what, what uh, false religion I'm talking about, but I'm sure you will know. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have made drunk, have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet coloured beast full of names of blasphemy. gold and precious stones golden cup there's another big clue in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication already there's only one that really matches that criteria you know what it is come on (laughs) and upon her forehead was a name Babylon the great Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Thirteen. Thirteen is the number of what? Rebellion in scripture. In biblical numeric... I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life. I wonder if you've got the word not underlined there were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Can you see parallels and similarities here of other scriptures? And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on...
called and chosen and faithful. Spare me, Lord. <laughs> and he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse... Ten horns. hell. Powerful stuff, isn't it? Level up. His glory, and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying...
First of all, the daily mass, adopted in 394 AD. The daily mass. Let's read what the Bible says. Hebrews chapter 9. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22 to 28. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves were better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, you're going to die but after this, the judgment. You're going to be judged after you're dead. So Christ, listen carefully, so Christ was once offered, once offered, never to be offered again, once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. He was the perfect sacrifice of once offered. Transubstantiation, the mass is a mess and is satanic. It is blasphemous because they believe that the wafer, the host, when it is elevated, is transubstantiated into the flesh of Jesus Christ. That's cannibalism. That's satanic. That's blasphemy. They burnt hundreds Thousands of people at the stake, the Roman Catholic Church did, for not recanting, for saying that they went with the scriptures that said that it's just a symbol and it is not the flesh of Jesus Christ. The blood, the, um, when we, we'll turn to there in a second, but the wine that symbolises his blood is just that. It's a symbol, it's an emblem of the blood of Christ. It is not the literal, physical blood of Jesus Christ. That's cannibalism. That's what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. Do your homework. Have a look into it if you don't believe that. The mass is a mess. Transubstantiation is anti-scriptural. Christ was once offered. He's not to be offered daily in the mass. That's blasphemy. Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10 verse 10 to 18. I think you'll find this is removed from the Roman Catholic Bibles. Check it out. Hebrews 10, verse 10 to 18. If it is, I wonder why. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, did you get that? One sacrifice for sins, forever sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering, did you get that? One offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Not a daily mass. Wherefore, the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he, has, he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. You become a Bible-believing Christian. You become a Christian. You trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for your sins forgiven. You have asked him to forgive you and to save your soul from hell. 
And you're saved for eternity. And all your sins are forgiven. You don't have to do a daily mass and pay penance and put your money in the offering to keep building this massive, great, false monster of a religion. You're forgiven. I thank God I'm a Bible-believing Christian and that I'm not going with a tradition of a false religion. See the difference? There's a massive difference. Turn to John 6. John 6, sitting with a Roman Catholic over breakfast once <laughs> in um, where we used to live, near Harvington Hall, a Roman Catholic area. A Catholic was walking by. I sat and had breakfast with him. We got into John 6, started talking about this. He couldn't finish his breakfast. <laughs> I'm not surprised. The scripture stuck in his throat. Look at this. Verse 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will will give is my flesh. There the Catholics are getting excited about this. Which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Roman Catholics say, well if you elevate the host, you know the transubstantiation here, it becomes the actual body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Man, like the Catholics, having a field day on this verse. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day, for my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. Man alive, they are up in arms now, loving this. This is it, this is it. This is transubstantiation. But then drop to verse 63. Read the verses in context and drop to John 6, verse 63. It is the spirit. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, what we have just read, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. He's speaking spiritually to them. When we break bread at the so-called communion service, the breaking of bread service, we like to call it. The bread and the wine, the unleavened bread and the unleavened wine, non-fermented in both. They are symbols. They are not literal. Talking to a Roman Catholic woman at Harvington Hall once, this deluded fool, said to me, I'm saved by the blood of Christ. But she meant literally. Remember? Not spiritually. Because they think they're saved by the literal blood of Jesus Christ in the mass. But Christ isn't talking about that. Agreed? Do we see the difference between the literal blood of Christ and taking it through the mouth In the mass, don't you think it's a horrible thing to even consider? The literal blood of Jesus Christ is incorruptible blood that is on the mercy seat in heaven pleading your cause right now. You're saved by the literal blood of Christ, but you apply it spiritually to your life. By faith. They take it orally, they believe. The mass is a blasphemy and it is a mess. Okay, what about purgatory? The doctrine of purgatory. Pope Gregory installed this or instigated this in 539 AD. Purgatory. The Bible talks about heaven and hell. The authorised version Bible is the perfect (coughs) word of God without error. There is no apocrypha in it. 
Originally, they put the Apocrypha between the Old and New Testament in the first editions of the Authorised Version Bible. But it was never considered Scripture. They used it as a historical book. But the 14 books of the Apocrypha, what they have done is, into, you know, they've um, put it into, interleaved or interchanged it into this, the actual Bible itself. So they, the Roman Catholic Church teach that the Apocrypha is Scripture, and it isn't. It's a satanic counterfeit. It's nothing to do with Scripture. The Lord Jesus Christ and the Apostles never quoted from the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha is nowhere in the Old Testament or the New Testament, never quoted from, never referred to. And we've said before, if you're a Bible-believing Christian, you'll understand this, and if you're not, you're already angry. But this book here, this authorised version book, the Bible, the Word of God, the Scripture, tells us, determines how many books are in the Bible. Just by reading the Old Testament, it tells you how many books are going to be in the canon of Scripture. And it happens to be how many? 66. So if you've got 67, you've got a perverted Bible. And if you've got anything other than the authorised version Bible, you have a perverted Bible. Here is the perfect word of God. So the doctrine of purgatory, 539 AD, instigated by Pope Gregory. Let's look, Luke 23. Luke 23, and see what the scriptures talk about this man-made place. Luke 23, verse 43. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Paradise. The thief on the cross had confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord, so to speak. And he died. And Jesus took him where? To purgatory? No. To paradise. Let's so read another scripture before we just open this up a bit. John 3. John 3, verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God abideth on him if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ you have everlasting life absent from the body present with the Lord the Bible says the Bible talks about two places heaven and hell no in between oh of course you can distort the scriptures and make it teach anything in the Old Testament when they died they never went to heaven they couldn't. Christ hadn't redeemed them through his blood. He wasn't on earth at that time in the literal form of Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. So they didn't go to heaven. They went to a place called Abraham's bosom. Read Luke 16. The rich man and Lazarus. Abraham's bosom. Hell and Abraham's bosom were separated by a great gulf that no man could cross over. One man did, which was the Lord Jesus Christ. But he was God. Perfect God, perfect man. A sinless man. And he bore your sins and took your sins upon himself and died in your place. And went to hell in your place, Jesus Christ did. He was the perfect sacrifice. Dumped your sins in hell crossed the great gulf and led captivity captive, took Abraham's bosom and all those in it, all the Old Testament saints, to heaven with him. There is no such thing as purgatory. Purgatory is a man-made doctrine. Purging your sins for a certain amount of time. Paying money to have your sins forgiven. What Man is so deceived, so susceptible to these you know, deceptions Purgatory, the in-between stage, the limbo. Was it a few years ago, the, one of the popes, <laughs> popes, where did they get that from? That's not in scripture either. One of the popes says, oh, we're going to 
so that babies don't go to limbo or purgatory anymore, or whatever it is, this limbo stage. So he changes it, the infallible Pope, idiot, sinner, on the road to hell and doesn't know it, or perhaps he does, I don't know. You have heaven and you have hell. That is crystal clear from scripture. No such thing as purgatory. Just look up the word, get a cross-reference, you know, get a Bible concordance and look up the word heaven. In fact, if we put that in, heaven, singular we'll put in, it appears 586 times. 586 times in scripture. Hell appears 25 times in scripture. Purgatory, no times in scripture. That's a fact. Limbo. Uh, Go on, I'll give you that one. Limbo. No times in scripture. Get your Bible out, do your homework. There's no such thing as the doctrine of purgatory in the word of God. Okay, let's give you another one. Prayers to the Virgin Queen of Heaven. Started in 600 AD. Prayers to the Virgin Queen of Heaven. I had a Roman Catholic, that one who wrote to me, saying that they don't worship or pray to Mary. He doesn't know his Roman Catholic Church. Matthew 6. He doesn't know what they teach. I've never met a deep Roman Catholic yet who knew anything about the Scriptures. Matthew 6, 9. Matthew 6, 9. After this manner therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our Father. No Mary, no mention of Mary there. Our Father which art in heaven. Luke 11, 2. We've just given you a few. You could spend all day on each one. There's that many Scripture to refute the errors of Catholicism. Luke 11, verse 2. Sorry, Luke 11, verse 2. He said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. No mention of Mary. Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God. According to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, cleanse and cleanse me from my sin. God, cleanse me from my sin. Mary has nothing to do with it. The Queen of Heaven, what's all that about? Read Psalm 51. We haven't got time now, but read it. The first Pope, Boniface The third, I think it is, 610 AD. The first Pope. You've got pastors, elders, deacons, bishops. You've got no popes in Scripture. Mark 1.30, turn there. These are just a few notes. Mark 1, verse 30. Of course, the first pope, they say, was Peter, don't they? Peter, the first pope. Very interesting that Peter never went to Rome, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, he was the first pope. What is it? Rome Catholic Church, do they say that, is it John the Baptist? They were saying they've got uh, the head of John the Baptist. But two people claim it. One said this, because when he was a boy, they've got the small one. <laughs> something. They've got enough wood to make a 700 foot cross or something crazy. Relics, they reckon they've got Simon Peter's relics and Paul's relics. Honestly. But of course, you know, Pope can't be married. But Simon Peter, he was the first Pope. But what do we read here in Mark 1 verse 30? But Simon, that's Simon Peter, but Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever and anon they tell him of her. Simon Peter had a what? Wife. Simon Peter had a wife, therefore wouldn't qualify to be a Pope. Ridiculous, isn't it? Kissing the Pope's foot. 
began in 709 AD. Kissing the Pope's foot. <laughs> Psalm 2, verse 12. Psalm 2, verse 12. There you are, someone's just kissed the Pope's foot and the ambulance is on its way. Psalm 2, verse 12. Psalm 2, verse 12. Probably got some disease. Listen, there's only one person you want to kiss, apart from your wife. <laughs> and that's this. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. There's only one foot I'm going to kiss, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Fall down at his feet, worship him, love him, kiss his feet. I'll kiss his feet all, for all eternity, I love the Lord. I just want time off to have a look around. <laughs> you kiss the sun, you have nothing to do kissing the Pope's feet. What's all that about? Smack him in the kisser. That'd be a bit different one. Kissing the Pope's feet, they are. Worship of images, relics. And the cross, worshipping the cross, 788 AD. The worship, the worship of images and relics, and worshipping and um, holding up the cross and kissing the cross. 788 AD, it was insti- instigated. Um, Exodus 20, Exodus 20. What's the Bible say? Exodus 20, verse 4. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Guess what commandment's missing in the Roman Catholic Ten Commandments? Isn't that interesting? They've taken that one out and split the next one in two, I believe. Can you believe it? They've taken it out of Scripture. You can make that book, you can cut it up and make it teach whatever you like. That's where all the cults get the stuff from. Taking verse out of context, writing their own Scriptures, distorting this. You know, some people are clever, is it the JWs? And the JWs get their Bible and they you know, cut it up as much as they want, written their own stuff, and then they, then they translate it into the Greek and say, well, the Greek says, but they've just translated their own version into the Greek so they can say that the Greek says. I mean, come on. It's distortion, deception everywhere. And the suckers are falling for it all the time. The Bible says, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. You tell me what a statue does. What life is there in a piece of stone or granite or marble? Rubbing the Pope's foot. And rubbing it away because they've rubbed it so much. Bowed, bowing down to these statues. All over Italy and Spain they've got these little groves. You know, Kilimanjaro the, near the convent. They've got this little grove of Mary holding the boy child, you know. They bow down to it and was it on YouTube or something where they were carrying that big statue of Mary? That's one of the best things I ever saw <laughs> in the Roman Catholic Church. Massive, great, horrible looking statue. Then they've got this old guy, I can't believe this old guy is about 160 on one corner. Dottery old bloke he was holding this thing up. And then what happened? They're just trying to bring it down to the ground. Of course, he can't take the weight of it. This fat woman up there. <laughs> and then the whole thing collapses, smashes to bits, and they're screaming and crying because this statue has seen. Talk about a laugh, man alive. That'd cheer you up. Unbelievable. They're going ape they are because of it. All because of religion. Oh, it's horrible. When it gets old of you, it's horrible. It's like a disease, a terminal disease. Worshipping statues, relics. You want to watch the film, Martin Luther. Watch it. Read up on it. What is it? Lorraine Beckner wrote that book um, about Roman Catholicism. There's loads of people who've written stuff on um, you know, anti-Roman Catholic. There's some great material out there. Read it. You don't worship images relics, saints or the cross 
Look at Exodus 34. Exodus 34, you worship the Lord Jesus Christ. You worship God. Exodus 34, verse 13 to 17. But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. That's what God told them to do. One of the first things they did in the Reformation, they were smashing up all the statues. They were putting the word of God back in its place where it should be. For thou shalt not, for, sorry, for thou shalt worship no other God, the Bible says. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a whoring after their gods. They go a whoring. We've just read about the great whore in Revelation 17. And do sacrifice unto their gods. And one call thee, and thou shalt eat of his sacrifice, and they shall take of their daughters unto thy, thy sons, and their daughters go a whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go a whoring after their gods. Thou shalt make thee no molten gods. They shall make thee no molten gods. Oh, remember reading about in, um, in the Acts where it's Diana and the shrines and making all the stuff? Idolatry was everywhere. Remember Dagon falling before on his face and smashing? There is one true God, the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. We worship God. You bow down to God. You lay prostrate whatever to God. You worship God, but not to a statue, a relic, a piece of bone, a statue of Mary, so-called. Give it up. Holy water, blessed by a priest. First started in 850 AD, I believe. Holy water, blessed by a priest. Show me where that is in Scripture. Holy water. I've been to, I went to a guy's house once who I worked with. And um, he was a Roman Catholic. And as we're coming out the door of his house, he had a little pot there, holy water, right there. And he puts his fingers in, he dips his little fingers and does a little cross sign before he's coming out. Couldn't believe it. What's all that about? What does that do? Unbelievable, isn't it? I was thirsty at the time. <laughs> it's ridiculous, isn't it? What people do. Traditions. See all these footballers on millions of pounds and before they go on the pitch they do the sign of the cross. As if that's going to protect them or they're going to have a good game or something. It's mad. Don't you think it's mad? These are grown ups, man. These are grown up people doing the sign of a cross. What's all that about? Where's that come from? The canonization of dead saints. Pope John the... 15th is it here? 995 AD. Canonization of the saints. Acts chapter 10. What's the Bible say? Acts chapter 10. Verse 25. 25 and 26. And as Peter was coming in Cornelius was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. They are the first Pope, they say, who loves to be worshipped. You know, you've got Ratzinger. Eh? Ratzinger, is it? And um, they worship, fall down at the Pope, they kiss his feet and they worship him and he loves it. Oh, he loves it. Peter here, their so-called first Pope that never went to Rome. Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. And Peter said, that's the way it should be, son. Did he say that? No. But Peter took him up saying, stand up. I myself also am a man. Don't you dare worship me. You know, even the angels don't accept worship. 
except for the angel of the Lord. There's a study for you. Luke 4, 8. You don't worship a man. Luke 4, verse 8. Again, these are just a few notes. There's tons of this stuff. Luke 4, verse 8. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. You only need to worship the Lord God. You don't worship. You don't fall at the feet of a man, a sinner. The Pope's a sinner. A big, big sinner. As we've said, the Mass was declared to be a sacrifice of Christ in 1050 AD. Hebrews 10, 18. I think we've already read it. Celibacy of the priesthood and nuns in 1079 AD. The celibacy of the priesthood and nuns. Not to get married, not to have sexual relationships. So where do you find all the sex scandals? In the Roman Catholic Church. It is not normal. It is not natural for a man not to marry. Look at 1 Timothy 3. What's the Bible say? The Word of God. 1 Timothy 3. One Timothy three, verse one to two. This is a true saying: If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Hear that? The scripture says a bishop should be the husband of one wife. Of course you can get married. Titus 1. Titus 1, verse 5 and 6. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I have appointed thee, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, so the elders can get married. Of course you can. Mark 1 verse 30, it's only a fake, false, satanic religion that says you can't. Mark 1 verse 30, we've read it before, Simon's wife's Mother, he's the Pope, so called, and he was married. Celibacy of the priesthood and nuns, no wonder you got scandals everywhere. It's not natural. That's why you've got so many sodomites and paedophiles and all this scandal everywhere. You find the statistics on the Roman Catholic Church among the so called clergy. Horrible, isn't it? You're either a Bible-believing Christian or you're a Bible-rejecter. It's as simple as that. You either believe this book or you don't. I believe this book. The Roman Catholic Church doesn't. Take your pick. The Rosary is another quality one, isn't it? Eh? The Rosary introduced by Peter the Hermit. Peter the Hermit. 1090. Sounds like something from Tony Hancock. Peter the Hermit. Ah, oh dear, the Rosary. Matthew 6, 6. Let's see what the Scriptures talk about. Matthew 6, verse 6. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and with thy beads... No, he doesn't say anything about beads. The Rosary beads. But thou, when thou prayest, enter in thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door... Pray to the Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Beads, rosary beads. Honestly, you're a mug. If you've got a set, you're a mug. You've made somebody some money somewhere. Oh dear, the rosary beads. 
Selling indulgences began in 10, sorry, in 1190 AD. The selling of indulgences, a certificate. 1 John 1 verse 7, let's just read that. And that's how they said they built St. Peter's Basilica, the Vatican, on the sale of indulgences. A money-making racket. You know, it's got its own currency, the Vatican. It's his own state. 1 John 1, 1 1, sorry, verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. You don't need a signed certificate from Tetzel or anybody else. You need the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive your sins. You need to confess your sins to him. Romans 3. Romans 3. Verse 23. Romans 3. Verse 23 to 25. For all have sinned. That's including the popes. That's including every leader. That's including... Um, Mother Teresa Madame Two Swords <laughs> Everybody has sinned Mary Was she a sinner? Of course she was It's only the Lord Jesus Christ who has never sinned For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God Being justified freely by his grace Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. And if you're interested as a Bible-believing Christian in regard to the propitiation, faith in his blood to declare the righteousness of the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, you want to look up 1 John 2 verse 2 and 1 John 4 verse 10. And you want to cross-reference those two verses. Selling indulgences. What's all that about? It's not scriptural. It's anti-scriptural. Man-made doctrine. As all the Roman Catholic doctrines are. Doctrine of, of transubstantiation was adopted in 1215. 1215 AD. And again, we've um, read a few scriptures on that. You also want to look at 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 to 26. In fact, we'll read that. 1 Corinthians 11. Great passage of scripture this, as they all are, 23 to 25. For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night <coughs> in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat, for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. We've said before that it's not... We're, t we're talking spiritually here. Look at verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and... Blood of the Lord. We're talking spiritually. Spiritually. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16 and 17. 1 Corinthians 10, 16 and 17. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body. We are all partakers of that one bread. Spiritual, not literal. As we said in John 6, verse 63, when they talk about drinking the cup, you're not drinking the physical cup. You're drinking what's inside the cup. Symbolic. Spiritual. Not literal, as the Catholics like to say. Confession, yeah, confession of sins to a human priest started 1215 A.D. Confession of sins to a human priest. And this is why you've got so many perverted Bibles, because the Roman Catholic influence regarding this has tainted so many Bibles. So they take out the words faults and put in the word, you know, instead of confessing your faults to one another, which we all have, we confess our faults to one another, but you don't confess your sins or your transgressions to one another. 
You don't confess your sins to another human being. Mark 2, Mark 2, verse 7. Mark 2, verse 7. Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? It is only God that can forgive sins. Jesus Christ can forgive sins. Jesus Christ is to be worshipped. Why? Go on, have a guess. Because Jesus Christ is God. And if you haven't got our booklet, you need it. Jesus Christ is God. Okay, let's give you another one. 1 Timothy 2, 5. 1 Timothy 2. 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. He came as a man. Perfect man, perfect God. The God-man on earth to take your sins and die in your place. He was without sin. He is the only mediator. The only mediator. Not a mediatrix. It's not a woman. It's a man. And the man is Jesus Christ. You cannot get to heaven without coming through Jesus Christ. Religion will not save you. Religion will damn you to hell. Whether you follow the false religion of Roman Catholicism or whether you follow the false religion of Islam, if, if you do not come through Jesus Christ, you will never get to heaven. If you do not confess your sins to Jesus Christ, you will never get to heaven. I hope that is clear. You do not confess your sins to another sinner. Imagine one bloke behind a door asking all these personal questions and you're confessing your sins. How ridiculous is that? How ridiculous. 1 John 1 verse 9. 1 John. 1 If we confess our sins, He, that's God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The interpretation of the Bible was forbidden to the laity in 1229 AD. We've talked about the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, lording it over the laity. That's what the Roman Catholic Church liked to do. They've taken all their cassocks and all their, you know, their special garments and their special foods and all this kind of... They've taken it from... Um, Israel and from the priesthood there and they brought it into the New Testament and they've carried on their traditions and they've distorted it and changed it to suit their needs and now they've said that you, you're not to interpret the Bible for yourself <laughs> now doesn't that put an alarm bell in your, you know, ring in your head doesn't it if somebody is telling you oh no you can't understand the Bible yourself don't you think that the alarm bell should start ringing you're going to go to a, a guy, a priest, and say, look, you know, what does this mean? And he's going to tell you from his slant, from his false Bible, what it means. And he's going to hold you, he's going to be your final authority, and he's going to hold you for the rest of your life. You're going to be in submission to him. And what they teach, the people follow, and they're not checking out the scriptures, because they are taught that the interpretation of the Bible is forbidden to anybody but the so-called priesthood. Satanic. Look at 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy 3. 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's you, ladies and gentlemen. You can... In Interpret the scripture, God can interpret the scripture and help you to understand it. You don't have to go through a priest or a pope or a pastor or an elder. You have a copy of the word of God. You need to submit to it and ask the Lord to reveal it to you. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 Corinthians 2, 7 to 13. 1 Corinthians 2. 
7 to 13. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of the world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man, which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. We're to compare scripture with scripture, and the Holy Ghost teaches us. You don't need to go to a Roman Catholic priest to understand the Bible. God forbid. Seven sacraments were declared in 1439. Seven sacraments that the Roman Catholic Church teach. All that stuff. Ephesians 2. What are we going to do with this? Let's hit Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. What a fantastic two verses these are. For by grace are ye saved, through faith. There there it is. Through faith. By grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. You can't keep the sacraments to save yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works. You can't work to earn your salvation. You can't do sacraments to earn your salvation. If you're going to church because you think you're going to get saved through it, you're misled, you're deceived, you haven't a chance, and you'll land in hell for the rest of eternity. If you're trusting in sacraments to get you to heaven, you'll go to hell when you die. Sacraments have nothing to do with salvation. It's a man-made doctrine. It's a money-making racket. It's lording it over the laity so they can dominate you for the rest of your life. For by grace you say through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Titus 3, 5 to 7. Titus 3. I'm going to have to push on. Verse 5 to 7. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Saviour that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Romans 4.5, nearly done. Romans 4.5 But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Faith in the Son of God. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Roman Catholic Church also teaches that tradition is established as infallible authority. That was instigated in 1545. Mark 7, Mark chapter 7, traditions. You want to follow tradition? What's the Bible say about tradition? Mark 7 verse 3 to 13, I'm not going to read it all to you. But let me just point out a few things. 3 to 13, verse 3, For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. Look at verse 5. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not the disciples according to the tradition of the elders? Verse 8. For laying aside the commandment of God, they lay aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men, as the washing of pots and cups and many others. So they're putting away the commandment of God and holding to the tradition of men. Verse 9. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. Look at verse 13. Making the word of God 
of none effect through your tradition which ye have delivered and many such like things do ye. They held to the tradition and put it above the word of God. Two more scriptures on that. Galatians 1.14 And you'll do that and damn your soul at the same time. You ever put your tradition on par or above the word of God. It's the word of God that is your final authority on all matters of faith and practice. Not tradition. Galatians 1.14 And profited in the Jews' religion above many mine equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. You watch those traditions. You stay with the word of God. You watch those traditions. Matthew 15, 3 and 6. Matthew 15, 3 and 6. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? And to honour not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Don't follow tradition. Yet that's what the Catholics teach. The interpretation Sorry, the uh, tradition established as infallible authority. Okay, I'm just going to have to read these others to you because we've run out of time. The apocryphal books, the books of the apocryphal were added to the Bible in 1546. And you want to look up in comparison what the Bible says. Deuteronomy 4 verse 2. Proverbs 30 verse 5 and 6. And Revelation 22, verse 18 and 19. And see what the Bible says about adding to the word of God. The Immaculate Conception of the Virgin Mary was instigated in 1854 AD. And you want to look up Romans 3, verse 23, that stands against that. And, and Luke 1, verse 46, 47 and Luke 2 verse 24 again these are just a few notes the infallibility of the popes how idiotic that is 1870 that was declared and you want to look up Matthew 23 verse 9 Romans 3 verse 4 and Romans 3 verse 23 just three more Mary declared to be the mother of God can you believe this and that was started in 1931. Mary declared to be the mother of God. How ridiculous that is. 1 Timothy 2, 5 and John 19, verse 26. And then they did the assumption of the Virgin Mary or the translation of the Virgin Mary in 1950 that was started. And you try and find that in Scripture. It's not there, it's impossible. It's a ridiculous thing again. And the last one, calling the priest your father. You know, if you're going to do that, call the priest your father. You look, ought to read the Bible in Matthew 23, verse 8 and 9. Matthew 23, verse 8 and 9. All we've done today, we've just scratched the surface. We've just compared scripture to what the Roman Catholic teaches and we've found the Roman Catholic Church wanting. It is a false religion. It is damning hundreds of thousands of people and over the past years millions of people to hell. It is a fake, false, satanic, blasphemous religion. And you follow it at your peril. I would say choose life today and read the word of God and stay with the Lord Jesus Christ and what he says above all else. Because he's the only one that can save you. He's the only one that can forgive your sins and get you into heaven. So you want to come to Jesus Christ. Forget saints, forget Mary, forget leaders and popes and politicians. Forget everyone and trust in Jesus Christ. And trust in this book, the Authorised Version Bible. Because the two perfect things in the world, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, 100% perfect, God is perfect. And his word here on earth in the AV is perfect. May God help us all to understand what we have read today. In Jesus' name. Amen.